Viele, die hier im Raum sind, werden ähm, die Arbeiten von Wang Hui kennen. Äh, zumindest, also mir sind sie äh, auf Englisch bekannt. Es sind drei umfangreiche Werke von ihm erschienen. Unter anderem The End of Revolution, China and the Limits of Modernity. Der zweite, China from Empire to Nation State. Und Chinese 20th Century Revolution Retreat and the Road to Equality. Für den heutigen Abend haben wir das Thema gewählt, China and the Limits of Modernity, the End of the 20th Century and New Challenges. This, of course, is so broad. Yeah, China is already an empire state uh, and um, the new challenges are very broad topics. So we thought you are giving the lecture about 45 minutes and then we have an open talk here. So welcome at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation with Professor Wang Hui from the Tsinghua University. Please. Okay. Uh, it's my great pleasure and a great honor to be invited to here uh, by the, the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. It was really fascinating for me to be invited by the Rosen, Ro <laughs> on behalf of the Rosa Luxemburg. First of all, I really feel honored and happy for this. And uh, I think that the best way for me in this kind of the conversation is not a formal lecture, or, but a kind of the conversation together, all of you. Uh, I share some of my analysis and information about China uh, and would like to uh, have a dialogue, uh, interactions with all of you. Uh, uh, actually, this is uh, the Michael's uh, suggestion for talk on this topic. And I just add something about the ending of 20th century. I more or less try to perceive uh, the, the historical transformation from more uh, historical uh, perspective to see that uh, um, because last years uh, there has been uh, discussions and uh, debates among Chinese scholars, intellectuals, and also political debates on how to evaluate the, the, the new developments, the achievements and the crisis in contemporary context. That basically, especially uh, after the uh, uh, 2009, that year was the uh, 60 years anniversary of PRC, and also almost the uh, 30 years anniversary of Chinese reform. So there were two, roughly speaking, there were two schools to evaluate Chinese reform. The one school was mainstream, basically mass media and the, the, uh, even the, the, the party's line folks on the 30 years. Basically opening policy, reform policy, that was the main reasons for the economic achievements. But on the other people will argue for the 60 years because basically without the, the independence of China, without the industrial system, national economy system, accumulated from 1949, that was very difficult to understand the Chinese reform, the contemporary developments. Of course, some people will trace back to the early period, argue for the 100 or the 150 years after the Opium War, especially the 100 years, which means that the, the, the whole process of Chinese revolution and its connection with contemporary Chinese, Chinese developments. So basically, the people will summarize the, uh, the context, contemporary context, as two uh, slogans. When we know that uh, before that, uh, up to now, still, a lot of people talk about the collapse of, the, the coming collapse of China, that uh, the after 1989. Up to now, still, the people talk about that. But basically, uh, again uh, and again, that was proved to be the collapse of the theory of the cla coming collapse of China. That was the one aspect. The second was after 1989. So many people talk about the end of history, but now it's the end of the end of history, maybe. But this not necessarily only give us an optimistic, uh, 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 optimistic the story, but because there was certain kind of the 
uncertainty in the future was still the new challenges for this. How to uh, deal with these kind of the issues? I try to study the, from uh, some the points to understand the 20th century China. And uh, before I talk about the, the end of the 20th century China, I would like to talk something on the beginning of the 20th century China, uh, especially when I came here, I think it's uh, maybe it is interesting to talk about that. Because how to evaluate the 20th century China is a big issue. The beginning of the century, I think that the, in order to understand the 20th century China, uh, that two issues, two singularities for Chinese beginning and uh, the, the beginning and the ending of the 20th century for China is very important. First characteristic of Chinese 20th century is the, uh, to some extent, is the continuity, so-called continuity of empire and a nation established in the revolutionary state building process at the beginning of the short 20th century. What I talk about is the, uh, the 1911 revolution. So at that time, the revolution's national movements and the disintegration of empires in the 1920th century, like a Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ottoman Empire, was more or less the, the similar parallel process. The fate of the Qing Dynasty at the first looked very similar to most of other empires. However, after all the turmoil, fragmentations, crises, and alien invasions, the vulnerable republic finally managed to keep its unity based on the former territory and the population scale of the previous empire, that the Qing Dynasty. So how should we explain the continuity between the empire compound and the sovereign state is a big issue because the all others after the end of the 20th century that the only pre-20th century empire remain its integrity with the only few exception part of the outer Mongolia in the Qing dynasty after the 1911 revolution claim its independence still uh, remain the integrity of the country. If we talk about China, if China was disintegrated the, in the World War I, before the World War I, or when we talk about the China, no matter its crisis or the achievements, will be very different stories. So that is a very uh, interesting phen uh, phenomenon. And also I talk about this partly because, uh, which reminded me of the 1914 debate I th or the earl a little bit earlier, when Lenin published his the very famous thesis on the self-determination, there was a part of that was debates with Rosa Rosenberg, because Rosa Rosenberg argued that the several it's it's touch upon the Pol Poland issue, right? The Polish question, and uh, and the Lenin encouraged the Polish people to search to search for the self-determination from Russian empire. But Rosen Rosenberg found, found that uh, he, he's, she thought that uh, that kind of the slogan will encourage the conservative uh, ruling class in Poland for some, it's, there was, so that's why there was a debate between the Rosa Rosenberg and, uh, and the Lenin. And uh, he, her arguments were that in uh, some several central nations, Central European nations, they disliked to, they didn't want to claim the independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So that's one of the reasons her, her argue for that, to criticize Lenin's uh, the, the arguments. Lenin's response to that was, it's the whole national issue is concrete, historical issue. It depends on the geopolitical situation. If those nations small nations uh, claim the independence from Austro-Hungarian Empire, immediately they are faced two more big empires. That was, the, at that time, was uh, the Russia and the Germany. So that's the, uh, her, uh, his arguments uh, against the Rosa Rosenberg. So I, I, I talk about this partly because we know that the Chinese Revolution was followed a lot of the doctrines from Lenin. But 
in this and also the theory of self-determination was very popular in the 20th century China, especially the first half of 20th century China for communists. But eventually, Chinese way that the, when we talk about the continuity issues, that from Lei Te Ching down to the Republic issues, more or less respond to the suggestions from Rosa Rosenberg rather than Lenin. So in that sense, of course, Lenin never encouraged the other, the, 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 the like uh, Mongolian or the Tibetan or the Uyghur to claim the self-determination from China. He didn't talk about that, but basically that kind of debates within the socialist camp, we can still can revisit that kind of the debates in the contemporary uh, the context to, to rethink about the how to find a way, because now we talk about the cri uh, contemporary crisis is uh, uh, the ecological crisis, the social inequality, and, and ethnic clashes, and uh, everywhere, but, and also in China, were well, quite serious about what kind of the solution to find the solutions for these is uh, uh, still, uh, uh, I think, deserve to revisit that kind of de uh, debate and the discussions within the left-wing uh, revolutionaries in the early 20th century to think about the uh, contemporary. That's what I want to talk about that because when we talk about China, it is inevitable to talk about that the, the, the fate it's of its beginning. It's 19, uh, I think, that the, uh, the revolution. And, uh, and also, I think that the, the, uh, the, uh, we know that the, the Eric Hausbaum's book, the, uh, the, uh, the talking about 20th century and the short 20th century, is the, the age of the extremes. Basically, her, uh, his periodization was dated back to from 1914 and uh, down to the end of the Cold War, that uh, the, uh, uh, 1992. So it's uh, shorter. And uh, for his, uh, the, he, he terms the period as the age of extremes, which forms a contrast uh, uh, with what he calls the age of revolution, that is uh, from 1789 uh, to 1848, thus implying that the 20th century was filled with the violence and it didn't leave us much legacy like the French Revolution and the British Industrial Revolution did. However, it is very difficult for Chinese to think about the modern transformation without the thinking about the Chinese Revolution. So that the short 20th century, no matter how many problems and the crisis happened during that process, but which means that it's almost not possible to not rethink about the 20th century uh, in order to understand of uh, the, the contemporary China. So that is, uh, I think it's, at the same time, I think that the, the uh, that a lot, uh, um, the, uh, to some extent, revolutionary period was, uh, in, in China, I term the, uh, the short 20th century as a long revolution. Basically, it, is, it was from like a 1911 revolution. There was a preface uh, from the end of 19th century down to the 1911 revolution, and also ended, almost ended, together with the end of the Cultural Revolution to some extent. So there's a long revolution, but it's a very short, uh, short 20th century. From 1911 down to the end of the 70s, there was an ending episode, long ending episode, that we called the 1980s. 1980s is a long ending episode, but the beginning of the new century already. So a little bit earlier than the ending of the Cold War, and especially the collapse of China and the Eastern European bloc. So that is the, uh, the, my uh, basic uh, the arguments about the beginning of the 20th century. What's the meaning of the beginning of 20th century for China? Now I think there was a second characteristic or the singularity for the China's 20th century. That was also defined by a kind of the so-called continuity of the revolution and the post-revolution at the end of the short 20th century. The, the, the ending of the Cold War 
we, we thought that the Soviet Union, Eastern European socialist states disintegrated the one and after. We know that, of course, there was a long process. But in 1989, that process started from Tiananmen Square. That the incident of John Force and triggered a series of the, the incidents, events, that the, uh, uh, down to the end of the whole socialist camp. But why after the ending of the age of extremes, so-called, I use that the, the uh, Hobsbawm term, China not only keeps the integrity of the political structure, population composition, and the size of the state, but also has accomplished to some extent that the, the, uh, the market-oriented transformation on the, the basis of the old state structure, that is socialist st state structure was basically, that's why a lot of people ask about the uh, so-called paradox. The, on the one hand, there was a huge radical transformation in the social economic situation. But on the other hand, the political structure remained unchanged. Communists still in power and the political system not like Russia and other Eastern European countries. Uh, transformed completely. So this is the, 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 the people used to ask about that question. So how do we interpret the relations between the market economy and the, and the so-called socialist state in China's context, as well as the context of the whole world? How do we explain the contradictions in China, achievements and the contradictions and the crisis of China? That I think it's a big issue. And uh, that also because after the 1989, that a lot of the Chinese intellectuals are involved in the debates. So not only the outsiders, but also insiders feel frustrated about this situation. The last decade, when the, uh, 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 suddenly, the, uh, from outside the mainly at the beginning, was like a lot of the international uh, organization claimed that China has become the second economy and the world surpass American become to become a first economy in the next decades. Uh, the first reaction to that was unbelievable. Nobody believed that was the, 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 the real. Not only outside, maybe inside, more feel suspicious on, on that result. So which means that, that the, after the 1989, certain kind of the uh, difficulty in our thinking emerged. It's not our, I think it's not the paradox for the reality. It's a paradox for our thinking about our reality. We don't know how to analyze this situation. So that I think it's a very difficult. It's a, on the one hand, how, how to explain that, the, the situation? I think that the, the uh, um, so in the debates about the Chinese reform, uh, many sc scholars emphasize the stability of China's development. I think that, that there were, have no been, not been any major crisis. Uh, uh, the people used to, to, to do the comparison between China and uh, the Russia. That was thought as a more radical and a gradual approach. But it, this is uh, uh, not really uh, uh, accurate because 1989 is a big crisis. And a series of crises happened that in the reform and opening era, the largest crisis in China encountered, uh, came in 1989. While China withstood this large crisis, traces of its consequences still can be found today in many areas. That crisis was at the same time part of the global crisis. Uh, but not uh, economic, but a political one. It's, it was an economic one. We know that uh, there was a, 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 is a prize system reform and the triggered inflation and the uh, panic purchase and so on and so forth. But basically, the core of that crisis was very political. So China's crisis can be seen as a precursors to the Soviet Eastern Bloc crisis. However, the difference is that those states, in Eastern European and the Soviet Union, all failed, even as China retained its basic structural stability. As with China, those other countries that were communist-led socialist countries, 
it's the same. The, 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 but so why did China not fall along with them? What, in the end, were the important factors in managing China's stability and in providing the conditions for the accelerated growth? And uh, even now, uh, in the economic crisis, still, the growth rate was among the highest in, in all the countries in the world, contemporary world. So after the 30 years of reform, what transformations have these conditions themselves undergone? So we, what, what's the new challenge? So what's the challenges from our historical legacies? So it is a two kind of uh, uh, the aspects of that. So I think there were uh, several reasons. Before I talk about the contemporary challenges, I would like to uh, 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 single out some conditions for the different fate uh, between China and the other the Eastern European countries, or, uh, including Russia. I think one of the, uh, the obvious uh, 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 the fact was that uh, the, even in the 1950s, 1960s, China was not the Warsaw Pact, the, uh, the, the member of the Warsaw Pact. So that was, that also uh, gave the, the, I mean, these were the, the eventually that uh, the Chinese sovereign status was not the same as Eastern European countries. So that what, what I, I think it's quite important to explain why the, the crises are much similar in the end of the 1980s. However, afterwards, the situation are radically different. I think this is the, one of the reasons. I remember that the, here we talk about the, the uh, like in East Germany, the last party secretary of Egon Krenz in his memoir, which was translated into Chinese. I read that memoir in order to understand what, why that uh, so diff radically different, different fates between China and Eastern Germany. It's, I'm not talking about the good or bad, because it's a different situation. Basically, he tried to explain that the collapse of the Eastern Germany, of course, maybe it's, it, He's some of what well, tried to find the excuses of that the mistakes that they they committed in 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 in, in, the nine, uh, in the early years, but basically he tried to argue that uh, 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 use the term of the so-called Bonnet-Geneuf doctrine that was the uh, uh, incomplete sovereignty he basically. He said that the, when he was in the negotiation with the Western leaders, they found that the Western leaders know all the secrets from Eastern sides because the Moscow already informed them all, but they don't know, which means that the, the, he, he, he tried to argue that the collapse of the, the Eastern Bloc countries, partly because of the sovereign state, was, was really depends on the Moscow. But he also argued that in the Cold War time, both sides, East and the West, are all in the incomplete sovereignty. Only America and the Soviet Union enjoy that full sovereignty. Basically, his arguments, I don't know whether or not it's accurate, but all the excuses and so on and so forth, I don't know. But basically, if you started from there to consider the situation in China, that was radically different. Because we know that the China, in the whole 20th century, China had a great support from the Soviet Union, the early revolutionary periods. And also after the establishment of the PRC, is in the five, first five years plan was heavily supported by the Soviet Union. After the Korean, especially during the Korean War, the industrialization without the Soviet support is not possible in the early years uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the uh, PRC. However, after the uh, mid 1950s, the, the second five plan already, China searched for much more independent path from the Soviet Union. That was internationally speaking, like in 1955, 
that the Bannon Conference, they talk about the third world countries and they try to argue that China was part of the third world. Not only the, the, the east uh, the, the side, nor the, the, of course, obviously not the west side, but try to find a certain kind of position in the whole global politics. So that's why from mid 1950s, that China involved in the third world countries politics very, which was to some extent later, of course, it, by the, by after the 1956, the uh, 20th century, uh, 20th Congress, 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, later gradually the debates between Chinese Communist Party and the Soviet Union, and after the, the beginning of the 1960s, that became a public debate. So that made China detached from the whole socialist uh, uh, the, the camp, camp, made its sovereign, uh, sovereignty status much more independent than any other Eastern European countries. I think this is a very important. Of course, that uh, also uh, explains the difficulties in that the, from the end of the 1950s to the early 60s. You know, after the end of the 1960s, the border war between China and the Soviet Union erupted. So a lot of the series, that's during the Cultural Revolution, was the uh, uh, very most difficult time for China. But anyway, in the whole difficult zigzag process, Chinese sovereign status was very different. And China trying to, especially under the leadership of Mao, he claimed that uh, we are search for the socialist part independently, which was, I think, without that long process, it's very difficult to explain that the, uh, the, the fate of, uh, fate of the, uh, the, the, the post-1989. I think this is a quite important. And also, the, uh, uh, from the mid-1950s down to the, the, the 70s, China involving those third world uh, the politics, that I think is very important because no matter different evaluations, good or bad, but serve to the the long ending process of the Cold War, that the, the bipolar structure of that gradually disintegrated because of the third part intervening into the global politics. I think this is a, a one of the uh, uh, the the, uh, the aspects uh, of. Uh, 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 of China. So, in that sense, the uh, you know that the, 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 in the in the nineteen uh, uh, early nineteen sixties, Mao uh, uh, the raised the slogans for the so-called the, the in the autonomy and independence, for develop its economy and the political path, and that 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 slogan had huge influence impact on a lot of the theory of thinking in the third world countries, like uh, the linking issue or the, the dependency theory issues, were really linked to that uh, kind of the theory of the, uh, the three world theory. So these, I think, it's uh, still uh, had uh, some impact on the uh, contemporary global context, in the, of course, in the different uh, the, 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 the conditions and the context. And that also served as a, because it, when the, in the 1980s, after the 1990s, a lot of the uh, economists and, uh, and the mass media comment, uh, commentators believed that, that there was a so-called the, 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 the Eastern Asian model of the, 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 all the new uh, Confucianist model of development. They tried to uh, think about the Japan, South Korea, China, uh, mainland China, Taiwan, together with Southeast Asia, were more or less the Confucianist models. However, the, from long-term long uh, uh, backgrounds, maybe there were to, to think about the, the historical backgrounds, it's important. But on the other hand, if you look the different performance and the political, ge geopolitical situation in the 20th century, China's path for its development is very different from uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, and uh, Taiwan. But partly because there were all these countries heavily dependent on the protection of the America, their recovery and the growth, early growth 
and accumulation for the next step of development in an, from 1950s down to the 1980s. It's really, it's really happened within the framework of the Cold War structure. That was a very much dependency on the protection of the America. But, but China was very different because at that time China was in a double sides. On the one hand, had a conflict with Soviet Union, but on the other hand, in the, from Korea to, to the Vietnam, had a wars with Soviet uh, with the America. Was so in that sense, Chinese uh, economic developments was much more independent. That also showed that the, the uh, even uh, in the 90, for example, in the 19. 1997 to 1998, the financial, uh, Asian financial crisis happened. A lot of people predicted that by the standard of the World Bank, IMF, Chinese financial system was much behind uh, compared to the, uh, to the Southeast Asian countries, South Korean issue. But eventually it was China's system uh, to some extent survived from that uh, financial crisis, partly because of these, the, the early uh, the, uh, political economic structure, which, which was much still uh, uh, to, uh, much more sovereign to some extent at that time. Of course, now it's, come, it's fundamentally ch transformed, but at that time was still. But in that sense, it's not possible not think about the early legacy to think about the later developments in China. It's not only, of course, the, uh, the, the, the Deng Xiaoping's reform, uh, that a lot of policy is very important, but however, without the, uh, uh, the, the thinking about the, the 20th century China, it's very difficult to understand why China paved the way like these are so different from others. So these are the first, uh, the, the uh, important issues. And uh, uh, the, the second is that the political, from political sides, I think it's also uh, important. We know that uh, the, in, a, in a Mao's time, or the, after the Cultural Revolution, one of the, slow, uh, one of the uh, 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 issues were raised and criticized by the mainstream thinkers and the political leaders about the so-called political lines, the struggle within the party, the different lines. Because without the protection of the certain kind of the democratization mechanism within the party, there were a lot of tragedies happened from since the 1950s down to the 1980s. I don't know whether or not it's still maybe ongoing, that you need a certain kind of the democratic uh, uh, mechanism for that. However, the political line struggle was not completely negative because without the political line struggles, it's almost not possible, no mechanism for the self-correction uh, 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 mechanism in Chinese cases. So you find that the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution and so on and so forth, every time the self-correction uh, happened from within the political parties. So the line struggles, to some extent, was important, serve as a certain kind of mechanism for the self-correction. And of course, that, that, that's a complicated political story, so I don't want to talk too much on that. But one of the issues, I think it's very important, from 1950s down to the 1970s, before the uh, so-called formal beginning of the reform, still a lot of the theoretical debates within the Communist Party was very important. We know that uh, the, uh, in the 1980s, two, up to now still, two figures were thought as a theorist for the reform. One is a Gudrun, a lot of who was the, uh, the communist theorist. But the, after the 1990s, uh, he was thought as a liberal. But it, it, if you read his books carefully, he was not a, a liberal. But if you define that is liberal, was within the communist the, the camps, uh, kind of that. Basically, his arguments for the on, on the values of the law of values and so on and so forth started from 1958. And another economist, Sun Yefang, 
who was thought as a commodity economy within the socialist system, his early publication was in 1959. Why that was the year, in the end of the 1950s, those uh, theories published these papers? Partly because they followed the Mao's early publication in the reports in 1956, after the, uh, the change in the Soviet Union. So that was the theory repeatedly re-emerged in the 1970s and the 1980s. 1970s, when Deng Xiaoping, uh, again, he, 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 he took the power, he used this theory to relaunch the reform before the days of Mao. And after that, he again used this kind of theory to launch the commodity reform and the market reform. So the whole market reform, the early stage, so-called the socialist market reform, was not directly came from the Western theory, but really dated back to the end of the 1950s, which was a certain kind of the transformations within the socialist movement in the 20th century. So th these are. Uh, the stories are forgotten by most of the people, including uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, scholars and intellectuals. So that I think it's a, a certain kind of, uh, 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 that was the one aspect. Another, the theoretical debates at the line struggles and what's the rule of that for the Chinese, the, the change, I, I think is uh, still important. Uh, the second one is that uh, uh, political issues is the role of Cultural Revolution. This year was the 50 years anniversary of beginning our Cultural Revolution and the 40 years anniversary of the end of the, the Cultural Revolution. In China, you had also, if you, if you read the websites, you found the two lines. Some people for the 50 years anniversary of the uh, Cultural Revolution. Some people for the end of the uh, 40, uh, 40 years anniversary of the end of the Cultural Revolution. Basically, that shows that uh, some people try to, those people who are talk about the, uh, the beginning, the, the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, they saw some ideas like uh, the, uh, the social differentiation, uh, the corruption, especially the, 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 the conflicts between the, bu uh, the bureaucracy and the people and so on and so forth, that all serve as a reasons for the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. That's why some people still try to use some reasons for the beginning of Cultural Revolution to criticize the political reality. And uh, some people will celebrate the end of the, uh, the, the, the 40 years anniversary of the end of the Cultural Revolution. Basically, they tra treat the, 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 the Cultural Revolution as a pure uh, tragedy for in, in our history. So it's, I have no time to, to, to do the historical an analysis here about the, the Cultural Revolution, the reasons and the, uh, the, the, the long process. But I try to argue that the certain kind of, the, maybe it's planned or the un, unconscious sequence, because you know, uh, you, you don't know what kind of the sequence of the, uh, the, the events. Uh, maybe it's a tragic, but the events, the some consequence or the sequence were not that the negative. The first of all, without the Cultural Revolution, it's no beginning of the Chinese reform, because in the different ways, the first of all, the Deng Xiaoping launched the, uh, the, the reform on behalf of the so-called total negation of Cultural Revolution, which means that the negation of the Cultural Revolution served as the beginning of the Chinese reform. So in, the, in that sense, the reform uh, uh, happened in this way was parallel for the political campaign against the Cultural Revolution. Was that the, the, the parallel? If you compare the Deng Xiaoping, his own performance in the mid 1970s and the end of the 70s, he twice took the power, right? In the mid, Mao reappointed him uh, to, as a vice pr uh, prim uh, premier and in charge of the economic uh, the, uh, the affairs. That basically, in the mid, 1970, mid 1970s, his basic idea was he thought that the the basic slogan so was against the so-called anarchism disorder, means that they, they, he need, uh, needed 
a kind of the order. So uh, in that sense, he, he was criticized the later performance of the Cultural Revolution, trying to resume to the 1950s, early 60s, a kind of the command economy, the model. However, by the end of the 1970s, he already think that the need, negation of the Cultural Revolution paved the way towards the commodity socialist reform or kind of the socialist market reform. So he found that the kind of the change within the 1970s, 80s already had the, the, the happened linked to that uh, 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 years. But in any case, I think especially the early policies that uh, there was a, we know that uh, in the early years of the Chinese reform, there were a lot of the conflicts within the Communist Party, uh, up its, its special leadership. There were a lot of the clashes. However, the whole social, social society much more positive to the reform policy, which means that welcome, uh, celebrate these kind of the reform policy. So basically, which also shows that the early the, the early uh, years, the reform policy was very much responsive to the demands of the social, different social strata, especially from the lower social strata. So we know that the, the Chinese reform started from rural areas. So that was when those different ranks of the cadres retook their posts including Deng Xiaoping, he came back from Jiangxi to, to Beijing. He know what happened in the lower social strata, the, the situations. That's why the early policy was much responsive to the social demands. So in that sense, after the Cultural Revolution, the whole bureaucracy was much looser. It's much more flexible compared to other, like the Soviet Union and, and maybe I think the Eastern European countries. Basic, so in that sense, the everything in a di dialectical way <laughs> to think two phases. Maybe it's a tragedy, but on the other hand, the certain kind of the sequence of that was served to the not necessarily all the negative. We need to think about these kind of the situation. Otherwise, it's difficult to explain why the early reform policy was welcomed by a lot of the peoples. So this is uh, the, 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 uh, the Cultural Revolution. So, and also I mentioned that we know that uh, a lot of people use that term, uh, the uh, feeling the stones to cross the river, that very famous slogan raised by Deng Xiaoping. It was to some extent, uh, 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 it, 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 it's, it's true that the uh, no uh, president uh, the, 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 the models, everything you need depends on the experiments and the practice. But it's not necessarily mean that the whole Chinese, early Chinese reform, w without their theoretical thinking. Though I mentioned that the early uh, discussion by the Gu Zhen and the Sun Yanfang, together with their counterparts, were huge theoretical debates about the socialism and its reform. So that was their theoretical backgrounds. So even so, that's why also remind us of the theory of practice. The from practice to practice is a theory of practice. It's not only non-theory. I mean, still the certain kind of the theory there, but together with the experiments. So it's not filling stones to cross the river because now we are in a crisis, as I. Uh, say that the, uh, the certain kind of uncertainty, because if only you, you depends on your feeling, the stones to cross the river, if you don't know where is the bank, then you don't know where, what will happen the next step. So, which means that the certain kind of the theoretical discussion and the debates, of course, here historical discussions are very important. It's not only the, the feelings of stone to the cross river. So 
even in China, what the, the, the some people will use this slogan to defend everything, say we, we, we have no, uh, you, you shouldn't do the theoretical discussions and the analysis, we only do the uh, experiments. But without the bank, where is the, 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 the coast? Where is the bank? Where is the direction? Then the feeling stones were useless and uh, made us in a danger situa dangerous situation. I think that. So that's why I think it's a very important, the theoretical debates. Of course, after the, uh, the, uh, in the, in the, from the 1980s, 90s down to now, the situation fundamentally changed because early discussions only happened, mainly happened within the Communist Party. But after the 1980s, 90s, up to now, a lot of discussions in the social media, public space, and so on and so forth. I serve as the editor of Dujou magazine for almost more than 11 years. So at that time, like uh, agricultural crisis, the Medicare system, the collapse of the social security system, and so on and so forth, these kind of the debates and discussions happened at the beginning was within the circles of intellectuals, and the later spread over to the mass media, eventually had an impact of the pol policy making process. So in that sense, the interaction between the policy making process and the public discussion transformed, not before, like in the 1970s, early 1980s, when mainly still these kind of discussions happened within the Communist Party. So now a uh, lot of things happened, it's not, and also within the party, it's very difficult to find the really uh, important d debate and the discussion. Everything happened there, but we don't know what happened there, but in other public space, we have the uh, discussions. And also another aspect of the Chinese reform linked to the Chinese revolution, as I say that uh, I could only briefly to talk on these, no time to. Uh, it's the, the role, the cap capacity of the peasantry in China. We know that the Chinese reform started from rural reform and also a lot of the, uh, now, a lot of the uh, industries entrepreneurs and the business, including those automobile industries, uh, was the peasant, was the, the, the boss was from peasants. So we know that uh, the uh, Chinese revolution happened in uh, agrarian society. It's uh, the, the, at that time, very few working class. It's a very, uh, actually not, not only without the uh, matured uh, uh, proletarian, also no matured uh, bourgeois, but it's uh, happened within an agrarian society. Most of the partic participants in the war and the revolutions were the, the peasants. So I think it's uh, very important to explain the later history because now the radical urbanization, now we have the uh, more, almost half percent of the uh, the, the urban uh, population, but still the huge amount of the uh, uh, rural uh, population in the world still. And uh, how to explain the economic change in China without the, the uh, radical, uh, I think there's a most radical uh, social mobilization in the whole 20th century. Without that, it's almost not possible to imagine the later developments. If you look at for example, in the 1920s, Lu Xun, the famous Chinese writer, wrote, we know that the very famous short story, Akiu. Akiu was the, the basic image of Chinese peasants. But look at what happened later, the peasants' role in the whole Chinese revolution and the whole Chinese reform. It's almost, it's very difficult to imagine how radical, profound the transformation in the whole 20th century literacy, education, and the social mobilization. That was, I think, these are very important issues. Social structure transformations, family, marriage, and the whole uh, the geographical changes were happened in the whole 20th century. That was the uh, radical, it's a rupture. I, when I talk about the so-called continuity, I use that so-called because even in under the appearance of the continuity was the uh, radical, profound uh, ruptures. That was, of course, deserve our analysis. Some were very positive, some were quite uh, 
in the crisis because uh, basically social structure transformed how uh, we, we talk about the rural crisis in contemporary China, whether or not we can have a real rural construct uh, construction campaign was still very difficult to imagine. But anyway, this was very important aspect of the Chinese reform. And by the end of these, uh, the, the, the 1990s, uh, the so-called Sanong uh, crisis, we already had a became a big issue. So this, uh, uh, I mentioned this. And another uh, aspect of that, we also need to think about the role of the state. So how to understand the, the Chinese state. Of course, the, the people used to use that term of the party state to describe those former socialist countries, right? This is a party state. and. Uh, and uh, this one of the in interesting phenomena was that uh, the, uh, the uh, like uh, uh, Giovanni Arrighi and uh, some other people, they thought that uh, they they tried to do some comparison because in the 1980s, when the uh, Chinese reform began, the the state made a, made a plan for the Chinese reform, which basically welcomed by almost all the social stratas. So uh, even when Deng Xiaoping slogan, we can think about that slogan. He said that, that we need to allow the uh, some people to become richer, rich, the first. Then no serious objection. If if the communist leader now say we just allow people to be become the, the, the rich, the first, you will be follow up. Nobody believed that. Now, if still the, the leaders continue to talk about that. But which, that the fact also remind us that when the legitimacy of the Chinese reform was accumulated from the long process, that the uh, serve as not because the Giovanni Arrighi argue, and some other people, not jo they argue that the, uh, because according to the Adam Smith, that a, a kind of the market reform depends on whether or not you have a neutral state. You have the, the policy, the state can issue the neutral policy to be beneficial to all the social strategies. Obviously, now that the people not be, don't believe that our state was neutral, because more and more, uh, it's capital oriented. But at that time, why the people believe that uh, we will follow that? Partly because of the political results of that were the certain kind of so-called neutrality of the state. So that's why the early reform for the, pe for the peasants and the later uh, the, the reform was welcomed by most of the people. Of course, the 1989 crisis showed that after mid-1980s, when the urban reform began, the situation wasn't. So that was mean that the, the whole social economic policy not neutral at all. A lot of people suffered from that, the, the even uh, only five years, four years, a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with the, uh, the, the governmental policies already in the 1989. So we showed that the, the rule of the state was also uh, the, uh, 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 transformed. I, th I, I talk about this partly because we, from political level, I want to think about the, uh, what's the, uh, uh, the crisis, the political in, in the level of the, uh, in contemporary context. I use the term, uh, it's a term to label that long process, a political transformation in China, that from what I call that from the, uh, uh, the party state to the state party. I mean, the state party means that the, the state, that the party, though still we know that the, the Chinese Communist Party, the scale of the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party maybe was, uh, is, uh, up to now, the, 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 the biggest political organization in human history because the membership, the numbers of the members of the Communist Party almost is almost equal to the whole population of Germany. 
So in the human history, I don't think uh, we, we, maybe church is uh, exception. The but political organization was is the only one that. Uh, so that's why a lot of the, the commentators in the West, also in China, they will criticize China, Chinese Communist Party expansion to, uh, to the whole state structures. But from my observation, I think that uh, it was not, it, it looks like the expansion of the state, at uh, the party. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, the function of political parties, or the political party in China, was more or less, it has become, fully become almost, the organ of the state. It's not no more a political organization in the sense of the 19th, 20th century as a political organization. It's, a, it's a very difficult to clearly define the val political values, political orientations, and the political mobilization capacity was weak. It's still, it's based on the, 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 the structure of the state. So a lot of things were still, for example, the, the anti-corruption uh, anti campaign was mainly based on the, uh, the, the Communist Party's department of uh, the, these kind of the, uh, central committee of discipline. But that served as a kind of the legal system, not formally, but certain kind of that it was mainly not a political campaign, but, but served to certain kind of the state functions. So in that sense, I use the term of uh, 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 this long process as a so-called statification of political party. And I think that the now the crisis, political crisis, is that uh, in many ways, in different countries, in a different social format and a political format, political party or the political parties is transformed into a state apparatus, especially like in a new liberal high tide that the centralization of political parties were, were, were the phenomena in many countries, but in the different ways. So we need to think about these kind of the, where is, where, who is the political role player in the contemporary context. It's, so in that sense, we can define that the, uh, even, even in the process of the radical imp uh, expansion of the party's scale, still we can think about the, the, uh, the con uh, new age of the post-party politics. Because it's not uh, the traditional political parties, not but, but certain kind of the integration into the framework of the state. It serves a lot of the, uh, the functions of state. That was, I think it's very important. I remember that the, uh, several months ago in Hong Kong, uh, there was a conference organized by New York Review uh, of Books. Uh, some American uh, the scholars uh, in the field of China her studies, they argue that uh, now the current leaders uh, already accumulated a the, the lot of the, the powers, even bigger than Mao. But actually they don't, they, they forget about the situation that Mao needn't that kind of administrative power directly. They still can use the political power to launch the political campaign and to change. So basically the mechanism and the function, structure function, let's say, changed, they transformed. We need to think about these. And that also serve as the, uh, for the political, because still the, the power structure in the state structure was still heavily depends on the party. So, but if the party transformed, how to think about the, where is the, what is the political? Where is the field of the, for the political is a big issue. I think it is a, uh, what I, uh, I think it's a, a big transformation. And that's why we know that the last years in the anti-corruption uh, uh, campaign, so many high-rank officials were, were accused, top leaders, uh, the, so many, both in the Communist Party and the military leaders, were, which means that the, the penetration of capital, different of capital forces, penetrated into the state structures and into 
the, the, the stru uh, party structures. It's caused a political crisis. So in order to understand the, the contemporary political crisis, we also need to understand the political transformation in what sense that the political party transformed, even that the people argue that the so-called, when in the beginning I mentioned that the paradox, on the one hand, China is a, is a, is a, is a market, economy, uh, market economy, though the uh, EU still not recognize the status of market economy of China. So on the other hand, it was still the, 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 the socialist state. In the what sense, uh, the, what kind of the transformation happened within the whole stable framework? So it's a, fun, it's, a, it's a huge transformation. I think I already, a lot of time, maybe I end with the, 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 uh, the, the, the one or two minutes for, 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 for this. Uh, of course, now the China, it's not only this, but also following uh, uh, the, the one step was China integrated into the global economy and became the uh, the, the, the member of the WTO and involving this whole global process. At the same time, the, uh, the, the China also search for its own markets and the resources. So that's the uh, new situation, new role of China, which also a lot of the uncertainty in the future and in, in, in the context. So that also showed that on the one hand, people talk about the uh, the rise of China and so on and so forth, or coming collapse of China, the people have different opinions about that. And uh, when I talk about the, uh, the early uh, uh, the, the autonomy and the independence, that the, uh, the policy from the uh, late 50s uh, onwards, the, the, the second half of the 50s onwards, that the whole, it's, it's almost not possible in a contemporary context to continue that policy because the whole sovereign issue was transformation. It's in the global, global so-called globalization and so on and so forth. So in these kind of the great transformation, China already reached the point that the whole new age already began. We, it's, it's very difficult to simply to think about the old uh, the, 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 the legacy to support its own uh, contemporary situation, the need to find the uh, uh, renovation and uh, uh, innovation and so on and so forth. And what kind of the social struggles within the uh, China is also the issue. Basically, I think that uh, now we talk about the, uh, the, the social differentiation, poor and rich, the urban and the rural issues, ec uh, ecological issues, uh, the ethnic conflicts and so on and so forth. And all these issues needs us to think about the new political, what kind of the new politics we can uh, 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 find out from the, the new context is a new challenge for, uh, 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 for us. I think I should stop here. We can do the interactions. Uh, the more time for interaction is better. Thank you. very much. I think we should um, um, concentrate the discussion on two topics and maybe separate them. On the one hand, I think you have spoken about the short Chinese century until, let's say, until the end of the, the Cultural Revolution, so more about the history, and you had not too much time left for the challenges for the future. So I would propose, let's start first with more of the history until, let's say, the reform area, and then we should concentrate, of course, on the challenges for the 20 China and the 21st century, because there is a lot which is quite close to us when you spoke about the um, problem of um, uh, statization of parties. We have almost the same in a different way, but never in a different formal system, but there are a lot of common problems. So let's start uh, with problems of history and your vision of the Chinese history in the 20th, 20th century. Uh, 
Hello, thank you first for coming. Um, I got a question concerning the perception of the Cultural Revolution. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know how is the perception of the Cultural Revolution nowadays, both in academic circle and in public? The, the issue of Cultural Revolution actually, on the one hand, of course, is a historic issue, but on the other hand, it's still the contemporary issues, as, you as I mentioned, and also your question, it, it, it's already showed that uh, there were different kind of the, uh, uh, the ways to analyze the uh, uh, cultural revolution. I think that uh, uh, especially last years, there was a lot of the memoirs, and uh, a lot of the memoirs published, not so much, uh, uh, the, research, the research books in China, in mainland China was not so much. It's quite uh, too mainstream and uh, dogmatic to some extent. But in the outside of uh, China, there were uh, more and more books and uh, discussions in these, because uh, I think there were several books already uh, published outside, at, at, as, at, at least I, as I know that in the English world there was uh, like uh, uh, Joe Andreas about the uh, Tsinghua University, the, the, the role of Tsinghua University. Uh, Alessandro Russo in, from Italy who wrote extensively on the issue of his analysis of the 1970s are very interesting, the thesis. And together with some Wu Yiqing's book on the local history and so on and so forth. Last, uh, the, the recently there were several books were very interesting, published in Hong Kong, the mainly the memoirs, triggered a lot of the debates on that. Uh, for example, you know that uh, uh, for those people who are familiar with the history of, of Cultural Revolution was the memoir. I think one of the most important one was by Qi Benyu. Qi Benyu was the, uh, the last the figure. Uh, uh, he passed away only a couple of months ago, several months ago. He was the last person who was still alive in, up to the several months ago, was the, uh, uh, the member of the uh, leading group of the Cultural Revolution. He, his member, he, he uh, worked with, as a certain kind of secretary or the assistant to Mao for 18 years from 1950, so that he revealed a lot of the stories. So uh, that only, not only uh, touch upon, uh, triggered the uh, discussions on the Cultural Revolution, but early events like 1959, the Lushan Conference and so on and so forth. So these are still a lot of the historic uh, uh, stories need to be more documents revealed and the memoirs, different kind of discussions. But basically, uh, because the last years, a lot of from the, uh, the more or less is a mainstream, we're worried about the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the repetition of cultural revolution in China. Because they said the whole slogan, all the slogans during the cultural revolution was very dangerous for the con contemporary context, though a lot of people worried about that. For example, the uh, uh, it's uh, you know one of the slogans were uh, was during the Cultural Revolution was the bourgeoisie was within the party. Uh, so if you still read these kind of the slogans, that politically speaking, it's very very they say that dangerous or the sensitive, and also the uh, the property rights issue. It's also the, a lot of the big issues because the uh, private property rights were the, the most important uh, the, the, the result of the uh, decades of reform. So if there was kind of the cultural revolution happened, of the people worry about that. But actually the historical foundation completely transformed. It's not possible to any kind of the cultural revolution. It's not, it's uncomparable. There was something happened uh, even some uh, stories are similar, but the basic political nature was completely different. But that's also that the people will uh, feel the necessary to rethink about the the, uh, the early uh, early histories that the 90s, especially the 1960s. 
not the 70s, because we know that uh, in the Cultural Revolution studies, there were different schools. Basically, the first difference was about the periodization. Uh, it's a one year or three year or the 10 year. So the, for those people, the shorter, which means that they try to find all the positive elements from that. Uh, the, the Communist Party had uh, the 10 years. That's uh, the catastrophe of the whole period. So that was the periodization issue was, is also uh, it, the, the topic for the debates among, uh, among Chinese uh, scholars and intellectuals. And I would like to know whether Chinese uh, or the Chinese Communist Party or uh, members of the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party do have a debate on the role China would play or should play on the world level regarding the world economy. Does China simply want to adapt to the current form of world economy we have, the capitalist world system, or should the China try to change the way the world system, the current capitalist system is working. Is there any kind of debate going on in that sense in China or uh, in the Communist Party? There were a lot of debates, but not, as I said, that it's not necessarily happening within the Communist Party. So it's a lot of debates in Chinese society and the interactions between different levels. So uh, the, the uh, basically, the what kind of the role of China will play in the, in the future, and also what kind of the, 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 the orders that so-called the, in, the, in the global affairs and the economic situations are, uh, are the topics of the discussion. Uh, folks, uh, it's, it, if that was a long debate. From the, like uh, from the 1990s, at that time, parallel to the uh, 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 regional integration in Europe, there was an integration project in, in Asia. They talk about uh, the uh, different uh, formulas in the regional uh, social economic arrangements were still there. Uh, it's uh, still ongoing debates on these kind of the issues. So there was a, a, a deep concern about uh, the uh, chaotic situation in the global affairs. So that, wa uh, that, that is, and also uh, quite uncertain. These are also debates on the, the, the uh, uncertainty of the Chinese role in, in the global the situation. So uh, um, it's, if you look at, uh, and uh, f uh, w maybe I give you one example. Uh, uh, since the, uh, the, the beginning of the, I think the beginning of the uh, the 21st century, there were several discussions and uh, basically target against the Washington Consensus uh, New Liberal Agenda. Uh, at the beginning, there was a debate on the so-called Beijing Consensus. Uh, so-called Be Beijing Consensus raised by the observer outside, but then moved into the intellectual discussion. Some people argue that uh, the, uh, the Beijing Consensus was used, the idea was defend Chinese the, 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 the path, I, but I don't think so, because basically when the people try to argue there was such a kind of Beijing consensus, they used that, uh, the slogan against the Washington consensus. Uh, and uh, later, like uh, the, the uh, Josef Stiglitz came to China, he, they had a lot of the discussions on the so-called post-Washington consensus consensus. That was also overlap with the, the Beijing consensus. And uh, later they talk about the whether or not there was a so-called Chinese model or the Chinese ways. This also triggered a lot of debates because some people say there were no models or the no roads. I also don't dislike to use the model, but I think that the Chinese experience, historical experience need to be rethink in the, in the contemporary context to think about, when we think about our future, we also need to think about our experience to uh, uh, what kind of the, uh, 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 the, the Im implication of that experience for the future. So these kind of discussions, are, uh, it's still a, a lot of the quite active. And for even for uh, in the last decades, I think economists were more or less, it's a, most of them were uh, towards the uh, new liberal, the tendency. But now, the last years, 
uh, including like Ling Yifu and uh, those famous economists, uh, they thought about uh, the, uh, uh, is there any patterns for the non-Western countries to de develop their own way for the economic uh, the, the transformation. These kind of discussions are actually a lot, and the huge debates on these issues. No, actually, when we talk about the Beijing consensus, absolutely mean that uh, no consensus, but, but it shows that the effort for go beyond the current existing models. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much for the really interesting lecture. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that when you compare the East Asian countries change in the 1980s, and I think that's one of the important aspects is that 1980s, that time, is a time for the rapid stabilization of electoral democracy in East Asia. And it's really interesting to see that you never mentioned um, democracy during the whole seminar. So I wonder, you know, when you're thinking about the new political systems or aspiration um, after the long transformation, um, what kind of democratic aspirations are emer you know, emerging, especially for the younger generation um, in the current context? That might be really interesting to hear. Thank you very much. In Asia, I think that the whole develop, uh, the, uh, democratization uh, moments in the 1980s was overlapped with the long process of ending of the Cold War. And uh, partly because of the, uh, the, the, the rule of China transformed. Without that, it's difficult. For example, in, 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 in Taiwan, that uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the whole martial law was ended in 1987, right? That was the, the, the uh, uh, actually that the whole process can be traced back to the end of the 1970s when China and America improved its relations. So that the government have to make the change for that. So there were domestic democratization together, what happened together with the international uh, uh, changes in the South Korea, of course, that the 1970s was a very important period for the democratization. And also there were a parallel process within China too. We know uh, that uh, in the end of the, uh, in the 1976, that was the uh, April 5th moment. And uh, down to the 1989 was still on behalf of the democracy and the, the democratization. That's a huge development for that. But, uh, but now the situation transformed. On the one hand, the people still struggle for the expression of uh, the, the freedom of expression, for example, and the tra transparency of the public policy and so on and so forth. But the, the, the content, the connotation, implication are more or less transformed, uh, partly because with uh, the, the after the uh, decades uh, development, how to make the distinction between the freedom of expression and the freedom of mass media as a in enterprises is a totally different uh, stories. However, the uh, the first the, the issue was took over by the second issue. So this is uh, uh, even within China is the case. So uh, which means that we need to rethink about these the, the issues. Second was that the, uh, uh, the in the 1980s, that the, the, at least in the context of Chinese system or the, maybe the, the, the former socialist countries, that the democratization system was happened within the polar structure of Cold War system, where basically imagination about the, the democrat, uh, democratization moments was learned from the other, right? So it's like the 1960s, 68. The, the student moments, young, young moments were also learned from other sides, the socialist side, maybe some other sides. But 1980s, basically democratization moments, the whole inspiration came from the West, and uh, especially America. Uh, when in 1989, we were thought that the next, uh, our future was the, the fit like America. But now the situation, I think that uh, when I talk about the so-called statification of political party, which also means that the, what's the, we need to think about when we talk about democracy, we also need to think about what kind of the political crisis now in 
nowadays? What's the different natures of that? Basically, from my point of view, on the one hand, the, 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 the reasons for the democracy, like, uh, as I said, the, 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 the freedom of expression. But freedom of expression was also parallel to the, uh, the, the development of technology. That was break down the privacy and uh, some other the issues. More people concerned about that. So how can we reconceptualize that? The slogans, on the one hand, is uh, still the positive value, but on the other hand, we need to recontextualize, reconceptualize that slogans. we well, still the, the need our rethink. This is the, the one aspect. Second, I think, because if you compare China or other different social systems, we find that the more and more similar, which means that when we talk about the social differentiation, ecological crisis, ethnic clash, migra migration issues, and all these issues happened and became major crises for each society, no matter how different their political systems uh, uh, are, that, uh, which means that we are living within the different political systems. However, the challenges to us more and more linked together and the, the more similar, which means that is we are really living in a new age, that the Cold War, uh, uh, the, the, the format transformed. Because before that, the different political systems are so important. Because we, you're living in these kind of political, one-party system, multi-party system, different, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. That's quite a different. However, nowadays, I think what in common was the detachment of the political system from its social form. Which means that the political crisis, no matter what kind of political forms you, you employed, then the detachment or the rupture between the political system and the social form were there. So I remember that, for example, Russia, of course, uh, it's not the, maybe it's not, for many people here, well, not the example. Uh, it, because it's, it, a lot of people don't believe that uh, they had uh, a, a democracy. However, the political scene, in from formalistic view to perceive Russia, that the political system is radically different from China. So, however, the, a lot of challenges we are facing are much similar. So which means that the, what kind of the political, we need a kind of political reform, but what kind of political reform became a big question. So in that sense, when we talk about the uh, democratization issues, we need to rethink about the new context. So without these, we, uh, the inner, because in most of the cases, especially in the mass media, easily to go back to the, 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 the early models but they forget what happened after the Egypt Revolution, after the Tunisia Revolution, after all these kind of so-called revolutions, what happened to the society. That became a big issue. It's a, still, it's not the excuse for not to have a political reform, but what kind of political reform became a big issue. We need to, it's a common issue to, to some extent, because if we want to improve the detachment between the political form and the social form, it's, it's, a, it's a man, I think it's a much more universal issues for the world. I was very much impressed by you showing us the deep roots of the uh, uh, political and uh, social developments in China in the 20th century from its beginning. And also the, uh, uh, um, the broad uh, Chinese independence as, a, as an asset for its uh, development then and in, in uh, and now times. Uh, but uh, the independence of China, or, or let's say the integrity of the Chinese territory is certainly also challenged, for instance now by the conflicts in the South China Sea. Um, China is uh, arguing mainly historically, saying that this was always 
our territory and China is certainly in a very advantageous uh, position having such a long history with written uh, proofs and, and everything, excavations. Uh, the other countries certainly also are de defending their sovereignty and maybe they are not in such a position. Now, for me, it would be interesting how you see this manner of uh, handling such a question and uh, where you see the, the, uh, the solution of it. It is a very important issue, but I'm not the specialist, of course, on the maritime uh, arrangements for this. But I would like to say something on this. Uh, I think that uh, we need to think before we involving uh, the different roles of different states like uh, China, Japan, America, or the, uh, the, the Asian countries involving uh, uh, the Philippines and so on and so forth, the, their demands, obviously based on their national interests. What I try to think about this issue in the two levels to think about, then we can analyze the different performance and the behavior uh, in uh, China or any other countries. One is that uh, the, uh, the, the whole geopolitical structure, that uh, the continuation of the Cold War structure was there. Um, on the one hand, as I said, that uh, the, uh, the whole regional, in, uh, regional atmosphere, let's say, the whole change, for example, improve, improvement between the Taiwan Strait between mainland China and the Taiwan, or the, uh, the, the Sino-Japanese relations improved, partly because in China's transformation in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the 70s, and a lot of the geographical changes. Nevertheless, uh, even China merged into the global so economy, but the, the one of the legacy in that region was the Cold War legacy. The, militaries, uh, the military structure in the, the whole East Asia and the Southeast Asia was still unchanged. We need to think about that. For example, uh, the Okinawa issue, the military post-war arrangements of Okinawa was the mil biggest military base in the whole region. And Afghanistan war and any kind of the in military intervention was started from there. And uh, the, the Diaoyu Island the issue was, it was the sequence of that the military uh, occupation of Amer uh, American military occupation of the Okinawa and also so-called handover to Japan in the 1970s. That is a lot of the problematic. So we need, when we think about the single country's attitudes, we truly need to think about what was the, the, the legacy of the Cold War. Uh, the period was still there. So these are the, the one issue, how to change the whole geopolitical situation, and then can find the ways to, to think about, the, the, the improve the situation. This is the one issue. Second, I think it's very important of the, we need to think about the order issue. What kind of the so-called global order? Now we are thinking about the, the uh, because the basically the sovereignty and the international law and so on and so forth came over, came emerged in that region only in, in during the colonial time. That before that, it was certain kind of the uh, 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 the regional uh, the arrangements. I think that the, I give one of example uh, here, uh, so called ambiguous example. The, the Okinawa status in from from the uh, uh, 16th century onwards uh, for the 270 year, uh, uh, 270 years for that long these the kingdom Ryukyu that that's we we call it the Okinawa played a crucial role between China the Qing Dynasty. And the uh, uh, China that dynasty, later Ming and the Qing dynasty, and uh, Japan. So that the status were actually played a very important role to guarantee that two big powers in that region not confronted each other in a certain way. So we know that uh, in the uh, old systems, and uh, in Deng Xiaoping in the late uh, 70s, Deng Xiaoping's slogan was first of all uh, the the, the, we just the, the play the role of that, the ambiguous, uh, the, the game. He, he said that the, uh, the commonly we can 
uh, use these the, the resources together. Uh, it's a Gong Tong Kaifa developed together and uh Gurjin suspension of the uh, the controversy. And uh, the first sentence was like a, a gesture, said that the sovereignty is behind it's belong to us, that each side will play that game. Each side play the game, say the sovereignty belongs to us. However, we don't talk about this. We just talk about development together and also to use the resources together and the suspension of the controversy. So that were from the, uh, the, the international law was not clear. However, if you look at the, uh, the, the centuries in that region, that kind of the system or that kind of the order works. No wars or the uh, can be uh, more, much more peaceful up to the 19th century when the, the, the new order was imposed over to that region. I think that uh, we think about that, uh, what kind of the solution. We need to think about these kind of issue. Some people will argue from, like China argue from the historical perspective, and some will argue from the formalistic perspective, the, the international law perspective. What we need to rethink about what kind of the solution and the imagination of the order to think about this. Because basically, if we based on the national interests, only based on the national interests, there was no solution. The only way was the conflicts. So that, I think, is a two issues. One is that we need a real substantial process of, like, let's say, to, to find the, the end of the real ending of the Cold War in that region. The military demilitarization of the whole region was absolutely necessary. Otherwise, it's very difficult to imagine a peaceful solution. So these are the one historical issue. Second, we need to think about the, the, what kind of the, uh, the relations that the people can, uh, the, the different countries can live the peacefully uh, link together to think about the, the new roles that I think it's also we can also learn from the, the the history to more flexible but not clearly argue for from the sovereignty because if you argue from the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the very clear uh, uh, definition of sovereignty immediately the issue of border were emerged. So okay, before that, I, I'm not a specialist, and maybe I'm wrong. For example, the, uh, the f uh, fishing boat. Some, uh, the fishermen, some conflicts, not only between China and uh, uh, Okinawa and Taiwan and Okinawa, but like uh, in the, before that, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the last year, still a lot of the reports about the, the uh, uh, problems with the uh, fishing boat, both from South Korea and the Chinese side. There were two countries, basically no big problems. That was a conflict that only happened after the definition of the borderline under the sea. So which means that the, you, if you only try to use that kind of the order based on the sovereignty issue to think about these issues, not, not that should not, not the uh, solution. That's not the solution, but the, the, the the beginning of the new problems. So in that sense, I think that the, the two issues are quite uh, neat. Of course, now I, I talk about the quite urgent issues, but I try to think about it from long-term perspective because I don't see, that if you continue this logic, I don't see the solution. I don't see the sol uh, solution. So we need to think about the, the whole regional change, the, the, the old Cold War structure should be ended, demilitarization, and to rethink about what kind of the order, so-called new order, can develop and by learning from our history. That in our history, some period was more conflictual, some period much more peaceful. What, why, what's the reason, what's the, the logic for that? I think this is the, the way of my thinking, not the, the direct answer, but this is my thinking about this. Um, if you look into the Chinese press, for example, People's Daily, 
which I do every morning. Uh, then uh, I observe two very interesting answers to the question, is what is socialist in China? The first uh, is now celebrated is 95 years of the Communist Party of China. No other part of the world has this performance. Uh, this is certainly something, and it is celebrated. It is not something which is hidden. The second uh, information, uh, connecting Europe and China, Alexis Tsipras is just now uh, in, uh, in China, and uh, he is uh, signing very many investment uh, um, treaties and so on. Well, if uh, this is not a sign that the, the weight in the world economy is changing because China as a socialist oriented, not yet really socialist as they say themselves, this is hope for everybody of us. <laughs> the first of all, the, I think that the, the new orientations, I think, is, as, as you already argued, that it's not the static status, state. It really depends on the social moment struggles, different forces there, which were prepared, which, which one were still the, I mean, uh, when we talk about the orientations, there were certain kind of the, uh, the, the uncertainties. So that's why the huge debate and the discussions on these issues were still, the, of course, a lot of the, uh, the, the people on the side of, I don't know how to define that, the left wing or the right wing, but basically still in China, a lot of people try to argue that uh, we need to develop towards the kind of the socialism, but it's really, dip uh, that was, that is not necessarily mean that the, uh, the certain that the China will develop to that direction because the, now the social struggles happen in a so complicated and uh, the, 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 they say that the, the flexible and the multiple dimension of capital was really penetrated in every corner. So how to develop the new orientation in our society, it's a, it's a serious challenge for us. I think this is the, the one uh, question. So though I think there's still a lot of people. I think that the, the most important thing I in China is that the, the 20th century legacy, up to now, still the living legacy, not a dead legacy. So that I think it's a very important that the issues of even the like a Maoism is the topic of a quite a controver controversial. However, the people easily to appropriate his slogans and his teachings. That these are very different to find the similar situation in in in, in Eastern European countries. I think. That I, I think is a, so that, that the legacy was still the living legacy in that sense. When I talk about history, the only implication was that, that we can learn something, not the uh, go back to the history. That's, yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. At the end of this lecture and talk, we are at the beginning to speak about the 21st century and not to repeat all the mistakes and not to repeat uh, the models of the 20th century. Uh, in your book, um, uh, Chinese 20th Century, in the end, you are speaking about a vision of equality of all things. This would be a starting of a new talk, because I think it was not clear by your uh, descriptions. We are in a deep civilizational crisis with regard to relations to nature, with to security, to the problem of democracy, because what you have described about China, we have the same in Europe, we have the same in the United States, so um, that means uh, this will open a new talk, and I hope you, we will continue at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to discuss this. Thank you very much for the evening. Thank you. Thank you.